All right, well, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, my name is Richard Griscom. And my name is Andrew Harvey. And we are co-presenting on uh, two projects, actually, that are coordinated together. Both of them are funded by the Endangered Languages Documentation Program. They're both uh, two-year uh, postdoc projects that are hosted here at Leiden University. So we have uh, kind of merged the titles of our two projects here, Gorwa, Hadza, and Ihanzu, Language Contact, Variation, and Grammatical Inquiries in the Tanzania Rift. So first I want to provide just a, a brief introduction to the, the Rift Valley of Tanzania. Yes. So um, the notion of the, the Rift Valley area, uh, if you weren't uh, at the earlier session today, it actually comes from this book here, from a, a book chapter that uh, Martin contributed to and uh, Roland Kiesling contributed to, I don't, uh, there he is, yes, uh, and, as well as Derek Nurse. So this uh, particular chapter, it focused on a region of north central Tanzania uh, where all four major African language phyla are spoken, as Martin said, uh, and they have been in, these language groups have been in contact for a very long time. So these phyla include Afroasiatic, uh, Nilo-Saharan, uh, Khoisan, as represented by Sandawe, and then uh, Hadza, which is uh, an isolate. Uh, there are also uh, other languages which could be included and have uh, not been uh, classified uh, or belong to um, other group or to they are spoken within the region but perhaps outside of what has been delineated as the uh, Rift Valley uh, area itself so for example Maasai also Swahili which is the lingua franca of uh, Tanzania and uh, Kenya and uh, other countries in East Africa uh, also, these uh, so-called Darobo varieties, which are uh, s smaller languages that have been more or less kind of uh, subsumed into uh, uh, more uh, dominant speech communities, such as uh, the Maasai. Uh, this linguistic diversity of the Tanzania Rift Valley area is mirrored in the cultural diversity. So there are many different modes of subsistence and kinship and faith that are represented uh, by the societies. Uh, of this, this area. It's posited that the Rift Valley area is an ideal place to study language contact because the languages are so distinct. So we had uh, we talked earlier today about this notion of the, the language area and how useful it really is. Um, it's uh, perhaps more accurate just to say that contact is occurring. Okay, so contact is occurring and occurs pretty much everywhere in the world. But what's uh, especially unique about this region is that we have genetically very distinct languages that are coming into contact with one another. So we have some very interesting uh, evidence of contact. And as foundational as uh, the, the chapter in this book was, uh, it was only one chapter. And uh, there's still uh, much research to be done uh, on the languages of this region. Also, 10 years on, our understanding of language contact, uh, language change, and aerial linguistics has progressed. So uh, simply put, now is the time to be revisiting the concepts developed in this book chapter and to examine them to uh, greater depth, extending them to languages which uh, they originally could not be extended to and reevaluating them based on new theoretical impulses in the field of language contact and language change. Uh, specifically, our two projects will focus on three of the least documented languages uh, of the Tanzania Rift Valley. These include Gorwa, Hadza, and Ihanzu. One central aim of our work is to bring these three languages to bear on what has been discussed in the 2008 book chapter through the use of large multimedia corpora of each language. Uh, before going into further detail, we'll introduce uh, each of these languages below, and I'll start with Hadza. So Hadza, also known as uh, Tindiga or Kangeju in the, in the literature, it is uh, now considered to be a language isolate that is not related to any other language. Uh, Andrew began work with the Hadza just this year, and uh, I began work uh, in 2017. Uh, the Hadza have been living in an area surrounding Lake Ayasi, which you see here in this uh, video, for a very long time, certainly longer than any of their modern neighbors. The area of the land that they inhabit has decreased significantly in recent times, however, due to increased presence of other groups of people. 
Today, large communities in and around Hadza land are inhabited predominantly by Datoga, Iraku, uh, Bantu-speaking peoples, uh, and others. Uh, herding also brings uh, the Hadza regularly in contact with the Toga pastoralists, and to the west, the Hadza are in contact with uh, the Hansu. Uh, no dedicated survey has been conducted to determine the number of Hadza speakers, but based on demographic surveys, it's estimated there are approximately 1,000 speakers. Uh, this represents possibly the highest number of speakers of Hadza in modern history, but due to a number of serious threats posed to their land and their way of life, the language can still be considered endangered. A uh, common belief among the Hadza is that uh, they were originally baboons until the deity Haine, the lunar deity, uh, made them human. The Hadza are often defined by outsiders by the practices of a nomadic hunter-gatherer model of subsistence, collecting fruit and digging roots, as well as hunting game and uh, large and large and small game for food, and living in encampments typically of no more than 30 people. And they regularly move from one camp to the other throughout the year. Now, uh, Andrew, you can introduce Gorwa and Ihanzu. And before we do that, oh, we have a clip sorry. of uh, Gudo Mahia telling a Hadza story. <laughs> Some met that if you were in our Pagamoshai, Ukoku or a Nakwe, Tashi, Vegeta, Ahamayamo at Lekea, Babesa, and Yama is at Lekea get Abes. Mehak, Sakame Amae, Amanaqueta, Ichinina heads. Bebe in Atonena, Ishokota, Dinke, a clamma, Gamota Titia, Kotaku, two letter clamma, Atonena, so, 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 so this is part of a story. We'll go back up to uh, Gorwa. Um, so uh, moving on to another language that's going to be treated in our uh, project. Gorwa is a uh, it's South Cushitic language. It's also known as uh, Fiomi or uh, Gorowa. And uh, I've been working with uh, Gorwa since around uh, 2012. And I finished my doctoral dissertation about Gorwa uh, last year in 2018. And so the traditional homeland of the Gorwa people, so you can see you can see the video moving around there, is uh, the area in and around Babati town and uh, the area circling Lake Babati. And so Gorwa communities stretch from here to the Duru River in the west and up to Terengiri National Park in the east. And uh, other natural boundaries don't exist, and so Gorwa speakers live together with speakers of Mbugwe in communities as far north as Magugu, um, and together with speakers of Rangi and Alagwa southwards into Bereko forest. Uh, there, again, uh, as per Hadza, there's been no dedicated language survey uh, conducted to determine the number of Gorwa speakers, but based on census figures and observation. I'd say that the total number of Gorwa speakers to be around 133,000. Um, and of this number, I estimate that, a fur that around 80,000 Gorwa speakers actually use Gorwa regularly. So that is, though may many people may know the language, uh, they may, for various reasons, not really use it. So for example, a speaker may not speak Gorwa if the people they interact with on a daily basis uh, do not speak Gorwa. This is a big reason. Um, they may not speak Gorwa if they're undertaking activities for which Gorwa has not traditionally been used. So with government officials or at church, for example. They may not also speak Gorwa um, if using the language is seen as substandard or unattractive. Um, so it turns out that there's a combination of these factors that militate uh, towards Gorwa being used uh, less than in the past. And so more and more Gorwa speakers are using Swahili um, to communicate in everyday life. So Gorwa is not taught in schools and is typically not written down, which ties into uh, an earlier presentation uh, today with Iraq. It's not a written language. Um, so, and also um, fewer and fewer children are learning about the Gorwa language, especially in more urban areas such as Babati town. Um, and therefore, it's a, it can be considered an endangered language. And as most, most groups in the area, the Gorwa are aware that they have not occupied um, their current homeland forever um, and recall a time when they lived elsewhere. So at this point in time, uh, stories place the Gorwa with the Iraq, the Alagwa, and the Burungay peoples with whom they live together as what they say uh, in the stories as brothers. Um, and this perce perception of common heritage is not surprising, uh, given that all of these groups speak similar uh, languages, South Cushitic, and, and share similar cultural traits. 
Um, and today the Gorwa are primarily farmers uh, who also own small uh, flocks of sheep, goat, and uh, zebu cattle. And important crops include sorghum and gourds. Um, and with that said, pastoralism uh, holds a very important place in Gorwa culture. And many Gorwa people will still identify as pastoralists before farmers. Um, and the majority of uh, Gorwa people now practice some form of Christianity alongside a large Muslim minority. And uh, all forms of modern faith are heavily influenced by traditional beliefs, many of which exist uh, with these new religions side by side. So I have a short recording of Ako Busakware talking about farming sizal when he was uh, younger. Katanan hat ita katanda atan lo king in gaga negari. Mukuren adur atan kure ma kote tlet bonde ni kote kate kame kinti kame kinti kame kinti kame gari ni nuhu katanda ni nukar durari kanduka kuus baka kuus atan di sille itana koko habra bonde ni kote kate anto koko ha ti pi manaka mukuta bira harda morga bina ki atan bonde ni sika hati san king na alki ekan ti ane atan kote ose ha tatar. I won't continue. I know that we're, uh, we have uh, limited time, so we'll move on to uh, Ihanzu. But that's a, that's a taste for how the language sounds, and perhaps if we can remember back to how, uh, to how Hadza sounds, significantly different. I mean, go back and listen to it again. Um, so Ihanzu, uh, moving on to uh, Ihanzu, which is the third language in our, uh, in our trifecta, I suppose. Um, it's, a, it's also known as Nihanzu or Isanzu. It's a Bantu language of the F. 30 group, and I've been working on Ihanzu since uh, around 2016 was when I made my first recordings. And so the traditional homeland of the Ihanzus can be seen here quite flat. Um, uh, runs south from the Sibiti River for about 40 kilometers, blending gradually into that of the Nilamba people. Um, and there are Ihanzu speaking communities can be found as far west as uh, the Doromo River, running almost parallel to the, sh uh, rift, uh, the sheer rift valley wall, and probably as far east as Haidom, where communities are mixed with Ihanzu, Iraq, and Datoga speakers. Uh, the north-flowing Sibiti River empties into Lake Iasi, uh, which can be seen as sort of this, this brownish uh, streak sort of on the top there by the horizon. Um, and uh, so uh, that's where Had uh, Ihanzu speakers and Hadza speakers are in regular contact, at least towards sort of the southeastern, uh, southwestern uh, area. Um, there, again, there's been no dedicated language survey uh, conducted to determine the overall number of Ihanzu speakers, but um, as part of its work on the Language Atlas of Tanzania project, so the Languages of Tanzania project, estimated that in 2009 there were around 26,000 Ihanzu speakers in total. Um, how robustly Ihanzu is being passed to children is another question about which not much is known. So an estimate for speaker figures in 1987 put the total number of Ihanzu speakers at around 32,000. So meaning that the new figures represent a reduction from about 20 of about 20% over 20 years. That's almost certainly too high of an obsolescence rate, um, as I've, I've observed children in rural areas still continuing to learn and use the language. But with that said, finding speakers in the nearest large town, Singida, is quite difficult, and children of Ihanzu families in urban environment were not really observed to use Ihanzu in most uh, daily interactions, even at home. And anecdotally, uh, Ihanzu speakers commonly talk about their language being subsumed by Nyilamba, a large language which exists side by side with Ihanzu in southern parts of the Ihanzu speaking area. And I mean, this kind of hearsay lacks rigor, but I think it's a, it's a useful starting point. Um, and it's it occurred consistently uh, enough for me to assume that Isanzu or Ihanzu is under considerable pressure from the neighboring Nyilamba. Um, and so the Ihanzu, again, have uh, extensive oral accounts of a historical migration uh, to their current homeland, and often recall moving south, often by or through Lake Victoria, or also known as Lake Nyanza. Um, and the relationship with early European colonizers was often one of mutual distrust and hostility, and the Hanzu took uh, active roles in, in uh, resistant struggles. Um, the Hanzu are notable in the Tanzanian Rift in that they are sedentary farmers, and they see themselves unambiguously as such. Uh, as compared with other farming groups, such as predominantly the Gorwa, 
which uh, prefer to identify themselves as pastoralists. And uh, so sorghum and more recently maize are important stable crops upon, uh, among the uh, Ihanzu. Kinship is matrilineal and residence, at least uh, in early ma marriage, is matrilocal, which uh, is different from the Gorwa, for example, which is strongly patrilineal and patrilocal. Um, uh, so culturally, the Ihanzu are renowned throughout the Rift Valley for their rainmaking abilities and their rainmaking cult. And this is an institutionalized practice that continues to the present day. And in fact, as an aside, many of the uh, rainmaking clans of the Kushitic speakers in the area, I know at least for the uh, Iraq and the Gorwa people, um, claim their lineage from, uh, from the Ihanzu or from the Iambi peoples. Um, and there's oral histories around that. Um, and uh, so modern religions, uh, so, such as forms of Christianity and Islam, um, have had less of an impact here than in other areas in the region. But communities of Christians and, and, and Muslims still exist, especially in towns and larger villages. And these new faiths exist simultaneously with the traditional faiths. And I have a short recording, which I'll play a clip of, of uh, Isaac, Isaac Shawri and Musa Gimbi flipping through photos of birds and describing them to one, uh, to one another. So let's see if I can. Changango Kitanga Kumus Hell Umrayangwana. Ah, who wants to do it? I'm calling an educator. Okay, quick, we are good. We hang on Gangaraginine and Gangaris and Keragin. Or I could not look at it. Manso got him on a hemicoco. A quarter of a medium jet, the other and the right. I'll stop here, but as we can see, I mean, just from your general first blush, you can hear that these three languages are quite different phonetically, at least. Um, so moving on to um, my particular, oh dear, all right, let's skip through mm -hmm. here. So moving on to my particular part of the project, my grant. Um, so basically, I, I want to study sort of these three of the least documented languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, essentially to broaden and enrich the empirical basis upon which our understanding of language contact and language change in the rift is built. So I'll move on to a more useful photo here. This is um, an image of the uh, 19, of the 15, uh, um, well, of the 19 features that were identified uh, in Kiesling Mouse and Nurse uh, 2008 as sort of these characteristic features of the Rift Valley area. Now, this, uh, this, is, uh, this chart, um, what we can see is that uh, Gorwa, for example, uh, so just to explain it a little bit, so, so up and down, this is, this is a single language or a single sort of pre-language. This is pre-Iraq or proto-Iraq. Um, and this is, for example, Hadza, and this is, where, uh, this is where Ihanzu falls. And so if you read this up and down, you can see how each of the languages uh, score according to these different parameters. And then if we look, these are, these are the parameters. So no, no voice fricatives. And we can see in the first column, that's a plus. So that means that uh, proto Iraq, which is sort of the, the, the proto-language that, that, that um, predates Iraq and Gorwa, um, uh, does uh, uh, rates positive for no voiced fricative. So there are no zzz sounds or v sounds, uh, for example. And so, for example, then, then there's the uh, that sort of infamous infinitive auxiliary order, which was discussed earlier on today with regards to Mbugwe and Rangi. And so we see, we see the valuations uh, here according to these languages, which were included in the survey. We also have Swahili, Maasai, and Oromo on the right-hand side. These were controls that weren't considered parts of the uh, Rift Valley linguistic area, but they were used as sort of controls. They were nearby or they were similar enough that could be used as controls to measure essentially how these languages uh, stacked up in terms of their overall, um, uh, their overall scoring for, for how they scored in these features versus the other languages that were considered part of this area. And underneath what you can see are uh, scorings for how, they, for how each language or each uh, language grouping uh, shaped up. So the first thing for me that we can see here is that Gorwa and Iraq are, um, so Gorwa has been subsumed under Iraq here. And uh, so my work has found differences that would result in, in different valuations here. So for example, Gorwa word order seems to be relatively non-configurational, whereas Iraq word order seems to be much more, um, much more rigid. Um, Hadza, uh, for example, has a significant number of unfilled uh, features. We have some question marks here and the same thing uh, with Ihanzu, which is represented under F31 
Bantu. There are a significant number of question, mark here, uh, question marks here. So the specific goals of the research project are therefore to um, fill the gaps present in the data. So for Ihanzu, for example, information uh, on verbal plurality isn't there. The existence of a duplicative body part nouns being reanalyzed as prepositions. These are all things that uh, can, be, can be looked at and can be examined uh, so you can see if they exist. And if they exist, you can see what they look like. And, uh, and obviously, you can fill in whether this is a plus or a minus on the uh, chart here. Um, so Hadza shows lacune for all of the features uh, listed for Ihanzu, as well as the feature marking for the existence of again our infinitive auxiliary order. Now we know that we know that um, we know that Hadza employs uh, extensive use of uh, auxiliaries, um, which uh, which tend to mark uh, which tend to mark um, the uh, agreement. They tend to mark argument agreement uh, often. Uh, so uh, among other things, so these are things that can be looked at and can be compared as well. Um, Gorwa, again, has been more or less subsumed under Iraq and will have to be checked for all 19 features. Um, and uh, basically, by conducting targeted elicitation on each of these missing features, a more detailed overview can be provided on the status of these languages within the proposed Tanzanian Rift Valley linguistic area. And these findings will probably be written up in the form of a publication. Um, and then, of course, is to, uh, a second output is to evaluate a subset of these 19 aerial features. And we kind of discussed this today with a couple of them, especially with this infinitive auxiliary order. We saw, sort of, OK, well, we've said that this is an aerial feature. Is this due to contact? Is this actually an aerial feature? Let's sort of take it apart and look at the history. And so I'm hoping what I'd like to do is I'd like to zoom into a subset one or two of these features that run uh, horizontally here and sort of look at, okay, are, are, is this a widespread contact phenomenon or is it simply, you know, is it simply that these were, 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 are, you know, were inherited from, from, from earlier languages, um, you know, and there was no real contact here, you know, is it simply a case of, of chance resemblance? Uh, so that's what I'd like to see how they measure up in terms of our, our contact stories. Um, and so additional goals of this project relate less to formal uh, linguistics and more to the social and cultural context in which these languages exist. So right now with a wealth of uh, rich data available for Gorwa, work may begin on the description of linguistic phenomena such as naming conventions and literary genres uh, because I've been working with Gorwa for longer and, and hopefully findings will be written up in at least two publications uh, co-authored with local community researchers. Um, and for Hadza and Ihanzu, both of whose documentation is at a nascent stage, Description, description of respective contexts in which these languages exist will be undertaken and, publica and public, uh, published in the format of the language contexts uh, subseries in the journal, probably you know in the journal language documentation and description. Uh, so that's uh, that's sort of a brief uh, run through of my grant, and uh, let's go on to uh, Richard's. All right, so um, my project is uh, a little bit more exploratory, but at the same time more focused. So uh, it's focusing just on Hadza, but um, as we've said already, uh, there's not that much known about Hadza, and even that that is known is based on data that was collected uh, only in certain regions of Hadza land. Uh, so a number of linguists and anthropologists have worked on the Hadza uh, language over the past few decades, but there's still not very much known, and also there's not very much data that is actually accessible. Uh, so this project aims to uh, remedy that situation by producing the first large-scale open source repository of Hadza recordings. Uh, the project also aims to provide the first thorough account of linguistic variation among the Hadza, and to explore any links between language variation and language contact. So contact between Hadza speakers and these other languages that uh, have been described as belonging to the linguistic area, the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, but then also some of those that are excluded from that uh, linguistic area, such as Sukuma. OK, so some primary outputs of the project consist of a large uh, time-aligned corpus of audiovisual recordings. Uh, we're aiming for around 150 hours of material. Also a time-aligned sub-corpus of elicited uh, grammatical constructions. And um, uh, this will consist of uh, approximately 60 hours of material. And then two uh, time-aligned audiovisual sub-corpora of sociolinguistic interviews. So the first will be conducted in Hadza by trained native speakers of Hadza. That will consist of about 50 hours. And the second will be conducted in Swahili 
uh, by myself and perhaps by Andrew if, uh, if I can get him to, uh, to join me. So this sort of bleeds <laughs> into, this sort of bleeds into um, how we're actually going to uh, collect the data. Um, and um, this is something that we're sort of quite excited about. Uh, both of us received um, uh, funding from the Firebird Foundation for Anthropological Research a couple years back. And uh, sort of these projects are ending their, uh, their lifespans right now. Um, and what both of us sort of did independently was we actually trained um, small groups of uh, native speakers. So I was working with Gorwa and Richard was working with Azanjeg uh, de Toga. And uh, we trained small numbers of uh, speakers um, on basically how to use audiovisual language documentation and also how to use uh, uh, the uh, Elon uh, uh, software program. So they all had laptops and there were, there were team tripods and recorders and, and voice recorders. And uh, basically, uh, there, were, there was money for transport around, for, for example, the Gorwa area. And uh, so everybody, so the, the four, the four uh, local researchers that I worked with, they uh, went out every week and they spoke to Bibi or Babu, so grandma or grandpa, or they went to different parts of the, parts of the Gorwa speaking area, working with um, musicians, people who told riddles, but people from their own community who they knew uh, or who they were friends with, who they were related to, and uh, they did their own linguistic. Uh, they did their own linguistic research. They recorded stories and they recorded uh, wisdom from their uh, their uh, community elders. They recorded um, songs. They recorded riddles. So fantastic stuff that, I, at least in my experience, I would never be able to record with as much uh, int intimacy and I think sort of just frankness. There was a, a tremendous amount of I think of I think comfort. Uh, and also, of course, because the individuals were Gorwa themselves, uh, the, these, uh, they sort of had their own choice as to what they wanted to record. The, the four uh, local researchers met every week and they sat down and they said, well, what's important here? Um, what's important to us? What's important to the people that we've been working with? What should be recorded? Uh, what have we done so far? What has the white guy done and we don't need to do? Or what has the white guy done and done a bad job of it, so what can we do better? And so out of this, we have a tremendous sort of um, uh, group of outputs um, of things that are uh, supposedly of value to the Gorwa people. And uh, so we have trained, uh, we've trained Gorwa linguists, essentially. And, uh, and out of this, uh, you know, out of this, we have tre tremendous uh, increase in local capacity and interest in the language and culture, and also just technical abilities, abilities to uh, turn, uh, uh, abilities to uh, use file naming conventions or uh, uh, work with metadata or um, make an ALON file and translate and transcribe. So um, developing some tremendous sort of um, transferable skills as well and developing sort of, you know, these local researchers. So this is a method that we're hoping to sort of carry on into our project uh, over the next couple of years. So uh, in addition to sort of our Gorwa local researchers, we want to train at least two um, Ihanzu uh, native speakers to be Ihanzu local researchers. And uh, we want to train um, at least eight uh, Hadza um, speakers uh, to be Hadza language uh, researchers. So the equipment has been, uh, has been obtained. And these, uh, these uh, teams will work in small uh, groups. So again, we have this, uh, we have this uh, rough map of polygons in which languages are spoken. Do you want to, uh, yeah, oh. do you want to jump in? OK, yeah. sure, I will jump in. All right, so these were the kind of uh, a rough demarcation of the three areas where these languages are spoken. So uh, this, this indicates through these icons uh, where each uh, team of local researchers will be located. So uh, each icon with a, a sort of a, 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 a video image on it, that indicates one local researcher. So uh, the local researchers are grouped into teams of two. You see for Hadza, we have four teams of two. Uh, they're all, uh, the four of them are, are situated in the four traditional regions of Hadza land. So there's Mangola, then there's Sipunga, then there's Kheika, and then there's Dunduhina. Then for Ihanzu, we have uh, just one team of local researchers. And for Gorwa, for these two projects, we, we don't have any local researchers because they, they've already uh, done that work from uh, previous projects. The additional icons that you see here, there are three more that show this kind of uh, meeting point. Uh, so those represent the advisory committees. And the advisory committees, uh, they will uh, meet on a regular basis and they will review progress of the uh, language documentation that's taking place. And these committees will consist of uh, members of the community. 
Uh, also, uh, over the course of the project, the PAs will uh, visit these teams of local researchers and they will uh, collect the data, they will check in with them, how are things working, uh, you know, what's working well, what's not working well, uh, and back up the data. So that means that um, each of us will kind of be physically going to all of these places uh, during the, throughout the duration of our projects. And so basically, I suppose to conclude, and, and quickly, because uh, basically this project is based on the assumption that language contact also implies human contact, which is something that seems very obvious, but maybe we don't talk about it very much. And uh, so inter intermarriage, cultural contact, et cetera. And it sort of aims to challenge these traditional assumptions of the African past as one in which isolated tribes have lived according to the diktats of tradition for thousands of years and uh, only experienced change when it was brought by non-African outsiders. Now I know that this is preaching to the choir here, but unfortunately it's still something that needs to be, that needs to be driven home and, and, and with uh, compelling data. And I think that you know, the, the Rift Valley area is a fantastic place to prove that these things are much more complicated than what they seem. And so uh, furthermore, it also aims to actively involve African researchers and, and, and people who speak these languages in this reframing process. And uh, hopefully it's going to provide a platform for uh, the peoples of the Rift Valley area to actively participate in and guide the documentation of their own languages. And that's our talk. All right, thank you. Thank you.